And now as this symposium winds down, we are very fortunate to be able to hear from this, this, this next distinguished speaker. She has been a professor of law at the University of Tulsa College of Law since 2010. This past spring, she began working as a senior research scholar in law at Yale Law School. She is nationally recognized scholar on the legal treatment of commercial and corporate speech. She is widely published in legal journals, written a book, made countless appearances, is an experienced litigator, and was a law clerk for the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth and Eleventh Circuits. I could go on and on about the many things that she has accomplished. You could see that in her bio. But I think it would be more appropriate to hear straight from the source. So with that, please join me in welcoming Tamara Paetti. Thank you. It's, um, it's just really great to be here. And I, um, I feel that there were a lot of people here I was really, really grateful to get to meet for the first time. Um, who I admire tremendously. Thank you to everyone at the Journal of Business Law and Technology for having me here, and uh, Dean Tobin, and terrific faculty, and terrific students. Um, I'm going to talk some. I have written a book called Brandishing the First Amendment. Um, I wrote this book. Um, I actually started writing the book probably around 2005. Um, when I got involved in the Nike versus Caskey case, um, or the aftermath of that. And uh, the publication of the book was delayed when it turned out that the court had accepted cert in Citizens United. And I said, hold, stop the presses, literally the presses, um, because this is going to change a lot. Um, the thesis of the book is that this the First Amendment has become the new sort of go-to tool for business to attack regulation. And it is sort of an all-purpose tool, and it's a very effective one. It's a very blunt instrument, as I think some of our former panelists have talked about. Um, and when I started it, I, I don't think even I anticipated quite how, how profound the arguments that were coming out of these types of arguments were. And I, I really viewed my role in writing the book not as a theorist. I was not someone who had a deep theory about the First Amendment, so I don't have any answers here for you. What I have are more questions and concerns. And I am very concerned. Um, you might ask yourself, um, how did we get here? I mean, like, how did we get here talking about this stuff, about the First Amendment, that seems like only a few years ago, particularly in the Hobby Lobby case, was um, a matter of some hilarity over at the ACLU when somebody mentioned, you know, Taco Bell as a religious organization. Um, how did we get here? And some of what I talk about in the book is, is some of how we got here. And now, this is going to be old hat for those of you uh, who work in this area, but for the students, I hope. I'm just going to give you a quick and dirty um, set of definitions and connections between a couple of terms that you heard a lot of, commercial speech and corporate speech. Commercial speech is a doctrine that grew out of the First Amendment in 1976. It was set up as a special um, protection, a limited protection for advertising or promotional type speech, which previously had not been covered at all, or at least that's the consensus, the majority view is that it wasn't covered at all, um, until 1976. And the court said, well, we're going to, because of listeners, and in that case, listeners who wanted to know the prices of prescription drugs, because of listeners' interests, we're going to protect truthful commercial speech. And then in a footnote, footnote 24, they say, now don't worry about that whole regulatory apparatus that we have, the SEC, the FTA, the, you know, the FDA, all of that stuff is going to be undisturbed because this is basically just regulating, it's offering a certain amount of protection for truthful commercial speech. It's going to leave in place most of these, most of these regulatory regimes. Um, a couple of years later, 
a different case altogether came up, um, Bilotti, First National Bank of Boston versus Bilotti, which involved an issue of whether or not a bank could engage in political advertising. And I'll go, go into all of the details, but the answers, the case as brought to the court was, do corporations have the same rights as um, people, human beings? And the court responded to that question saying, that's the wrong question. The right question is whether or not this is the kind of speech that has traditionally been protected. The answer to that question is, of course, yes. So we will protect it. Now, that was a little bit of sleight of hand, right? Because if you interpret the question as, is this kind of speech by corporations the type that we've normally been protected, then the answer is not so easy. Right, um, But what that did, and one of the things that the court cited to, was its earlier decision two years before in Virginia Pharmacy offering the observation that, well, just because a corporation says it doesn't mean that it's, you know, some kind of degraded speech. Um, so that's the corporate speech doctrine, commercial speech, the, the um, promotional speech. Um, what emerged from this over time, since the, uh, particularly taking up speed in the 1990s, was a kind of argument that I will um, call the corporate civil rights movement. And it has taken us to a place of that is just, is really stunning, where we have Simultaneously, the court cutting back in areas like the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act and actual discrimination against living human beings who, you know, breathe and bleed and die. Um, and at the same time, embracing this very robust idea of corporate personhood and suggesting that, dis that distinguishing between corporations, between a for-profit and a not-for-profit, between a for-profit that engages in a particular type of business and some other type of business is somehow invidious discrimination that offends principles of equality. Now that, more even than the First Amendment, I mean the First Amendment was the first wave of this litigation, this attitude. This next wave, the next wave that we are seeing is a straight up equal protection argument. So we're seeing in the Seattle, you know, the the claim that the Seattle minimum wage violates equal protection because, you know, it makes an exception for franchise, for um, small businesses, but then small franchisee businesses are not accepted, so then, you know, this violates equal protection. And we have the, to me, and I think, Neil, you, this is your, in your bailiwick, sort of the startling proposition of a judge in, in Missouri analogizing a, a ballot, whatever you think about the ballot proposal about, you know, energy efficient companies and whether or not we should get tax breaks and so forth, but analogizing that proposal to Romer v. Evans, which is, you know, the discrimination against gay people, and saying that this is offensive at the same level is just, you know, it's rather it's kind of breathtaking. And it's, it's, um, you know, we have a situation in which real life people have more difficulty defending themselves against harassment, uh, revenge porn, um, you know, hate speech and so forth than, um, than companies. And we have um, most recent example that I find really interesting is the, um, the uh, trademark um, cancellation of the Redskins trademark and the, um, the litigation that's arisen out of that and the, this is, this is largely an evidentiary dispute um, in which the f pro football makes the claim that there's no evidence that Redskins is a derogatory term. <laughs> and the fact that for decades actual individual Native Americans have been suing to try to cancel the trademark is just I don't know, I, just a little piece of, of interesting anecdotal evidence, but not evidence that it's, you know, disparaging to anyone. Um, I think that what we see, you know, looking for 
um, an overarching theory or some consistency in this case law is probably um, not likely to um, make anyone feel particularly comfortable. What we see is actually deep asymmetry. We see like a broad kind of embrace of strong, robust personhood and rights on behalf of corporate entities at a global level. And I must emphasize, as some of our previous speakers have done, that it's, in some sense, this is a First Amendment, equal protection. This is the guys it's taking here. But most of the companies that are bringing these claims and have the resources to bring these claims are bringing them under whatever legal theory works elsewhere, but they're making claims under human rights in Europe and in other places. Um, what we are seeing is this deep asymmetry. So, you know, robust protection for corporate rights, but also robust protection for intellectual property, robust protection for, you know, ag gag and veggie libel. It's easier to, you know, get in trouble and have damages assessed against you for libeling a vegetable than a person. Um, I think most people feel like there's something wrong with that. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure about you, but I think that most of us at some kind of intuitive level think that that's, um, that there's a problem with that. Um, one of the interesting things though, as I say intuitive, is one of the, one of the in criticisms that I encountered early on right away was that I just hate capitalism, you know. I just, you know, you just, Tamara, you just, you know, you're just a leftist Marxist commie who just doesn't like the free enterprise system. Let me just say that this characterization or this caricature is belied by the lineup of very esteemed um, members of the corporate bar, many of whom have been on the forefront of crying, wait, wait, something is wrong here, something is going wrong here. Um, like um, Professor Coates at Harvard, like L Professor Babchuk, like Professor Greenwood, um, like some of our um, uh, panelists here today, and Chief Justice Leo Strine of the Delaware Supreme Court. Um, I don't think anyone would identify him um, as an anti-capitalist. And again, not to pick on you, Neil, but, but as, as a former clerk, that well-known enemy of capitalism, Chief Justice Rehnquist, who was an early and often critic of both Virginia Pharmacy, in which he wrote a dissent, and Bilotti, in which he wrote another dissent, and, you know, so these objections are not ones that are coming from some hostility to capitalism or some hostility to business. I love business. I love business in its place. One of the great things about business is that sort of non-discrimination principle. And one of the saddest things about Hobby Lobby and some of the developments that we've seen here is the enthusiasm with which some people are trying to reject money as their only, you know, like I'm just, not, I don't just care about green, I have principles. And my principle is I want to discriminate against gays. You know, I want to make sure that, that people know that they can't be served in my restaurant or I won't bake them a cake. Um, I, you know, I just, I find that really um, kind of tragic, but it's also, I think, maybe some sort of spasmodic reaction to a situation in which we are, we have some very deep problems. Like, one of the problems that we have, um, that we are encountering here is um, what Thomas Thomas Piquité, if I'm going to pronounce his name correctly, has referred to as oligarchic capture. If you don't trust government, it may be that there's a good reason for not trusting government if governments, if governments being captured by lobbying groups that, that are at the table to create legislation that helps get them the loopholes that they want and the ACA and some other places. Um, and that creates a crisis in who we believe. Like, if, you know, when I was growing up, and I'll date myself as like old, an old person here, but, you know, 
when the government said something, the government was not just another interest group, right? It was not an interest group that was part of like some sort of cabal of these interest group and everybody's just equal, but rather we expected that they had um, their interest to us to serve the public interest. That is not, I don't think, a common assumption in a lot of places in America. And we are in a world now where a senator from my state, I, I mean, he's not mine, I didn't vote for him, but is <laughs> <laughs> lobbying snow. Huh? Yeah, I know, but I mean, all I can say is I didn't, I didn't vote for him, right? Okay, but I just meant you were familiar with it. You weren't responsible for it. Um, is lobbing snowballs in the Senate, well, the Senate to talk about his suspicion about global warming. We have people refusing vaccines because of this sort of democratization and rejection of expertise. And you know, that rejection of expertise is a serious problem for public health. I mean, I, I am not, I teach expert evidence. I teach about the ways in which, you know, um, status and institutional affiliation and all of those things can lead us astray. And sometimes the experts are wrong. I get that. The experts and the government are not always right. But the question is, what is it in comparison to? Right? What are we comparing it to? And some of this stuff, the laissez-faire of the marketplace of ideas, we have been there. We have not been there. Our grandparents, our great-grandparents have been there. It was called the 19th century. And do we want to go back to that? Do you want a situation in which you have to figure out whether the food you eat is safe or whether the stroller for your child is safe, that you know it's every man for himself? Milton Friedman you know, said that businesses ought to stick to business. That's what they do. We did not elect them for their expertise in, in you know, making decisions about the safeties of strollers and stuff like that. We tell them what to do, and then they will make money, and everybody will be happy. And that, that you know, when, when, mar when the government is in a position to create, um, to correct for market failures, where there's markets for lemons, where there's monopolies, that sort of thing, that those are the kinds of situations in which capitalism can do what has made it in many cases, not solely, but one of the greatest engines for human happiness and freedom the world has ever known. And we are in danger of losing that. We are in danger of losing that, and I think that it's a serious problem. I don't know that the people in this room can solve that problem. <laughs> I hate to like throw you out there in the world on such a downer note, but, uh, but I, think it's, I think we have to be concerned about, like, about what this idea of equal rights for corporations means in an where we're talking about entities that do not bleed, that do not suffer, we are n which are not arm in arm with Rosa Parks sitting, in, that are not going to jail, that this is not, that, this, this was not meant for them, and that fact-sensitive sorts of policy judgments depending on the size of the corporation, who's, who's I'm sorry, who, who it's made up of, what its purpose is, all of those kinds of things that we have done before, like in Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce, we can do again. So my recommendation is a conservative one, go back <laughs> to some of what we did before, and Notwithstanding technological changes, um, I think that that may be some of our only hope to solve problems that they didn't even dream of in the 19th century, like the sustainability of life on Earth. So thank you for having me, and um, sorry I went a little over time. <laughs>